please join us again. Please join us again tomorrow at the same time uh, with the same link that you used today. Um, and we will be there for answering any questions. Great, so without further ado, what is AI? That's the task I was given, thank you, <laughs> for this absolute gem of a present. <clears throat> Christmas could not have been better. And um, trying to obviously unpick and unpack AI for people who are not trained um, in technology is always a very difficult task. I'll give you an example of what I mean by how difficult this might be. and. Let's look first at the map that was put together by a um, scientist in the Ukraine who has looked at all the different permutations and ramifications of AI if you start thinking of the concept from a neuroscience point of view, from a robotics point of view, from a theoretical point of view, or whether you are looking at machine, machine learning. Obviously, we're not going to go into any of the details, but the point I'm making is that AI is actually a concept that is extremely difficult to define. If you look at another example, uh, here we have a museum in Japan who is looking more at what AI is capable to do and what feelings it might elucidate in consumers and users of AI. And we have um, different zones that they've identified. AI can induce anxiety. Um, it seems to control feelings. It's um, in pre impeaching on privacy, uh, sorry, encroaching on privacy. AI um, might um, alert us to have great expectation of results. We could use it for medical uses and cure um, more disease more quickly. There's a zone um, with trust, but there's also one of rejection. And the feelings of rejections they found in their mapping comes a lot with uh, cloning or this idea and some of the usage that we started to see, which is using AI to effect replace people that have departed that are actually uh, deceased and continue conversations with them. So um, this is about feelings, but you can also think of AI in a, in a lot more straightforward technical um, a view looking at the techniques or the functions and the applications of AI, what we see in common practice is that we use the word artificial intelligence. We use AI as an acronym pretty much to describe all of the above. And that creates a few problems uh, for us because we are all going to use AI and perhaps mean something slightly different. Um, but for the purpose of explaining what it is for newcomers, I think artificial intelligence, which is a very broad discipline, as you have seen, can be described as a collection of advanced software technologies and applications that are allowing, allowing machines to stimulate, to simulate, sorry, different aspects of human intelligence. Most critically, learning and decision making. Now, the type of AI that you will normally have um, heard about is probably machine learning. It's become very prevalent as the technique powering the AI. The other type of AI you may have come across um, and might be um, creating some concern is generative AI. Generative AI is obviously the type of AI that is used by ChatGPT developed by OpenAI or Google Bard, which actually is a technique which generates new content. So the AI is not simply executing a task much better than we could before, but is also creating from the data and from the learning that it's done new materials and new content. Now, the field is extremely broad and complicated. Um, if you wish to learn more about the definitions, um, we will put out after the seminars have um, finished some technical notes, which obviously will contain a little bit more of that detail. 
So perhaps most of the AI that consumers might be able to come across at this point will work on machine learning. There again, if you want to explore that, you will come across many different um, notions and types of machine learning, supervised machine learning, unsupervised, reinforced, neural networks, natural language processing. All of them are variation on how the technology works and what type of learning the machine is able to do and what applications can come from it. Now, AI is obviously something that we need to be concerned with um, because it is now used in many applications as a consumer product in itself, JetGPT is quite an entertaining product to play with, but also in consumer products. So it's quite hard to avoid some of those techniques. Um, there is widespread use in business to consumer e-commerce, and you will have come across AI powered applications, whether you watch um, some television um, on um, channels that will allow personalized recommendations that will be AI powered. They will guess from how many rom-com you have watched, your likelihood of wanting to watch another one and present that content. Chatbots, virtual shopping assistants will also use AI so, and also dynamic pricing, which al allows the trader to update pricing based um, on supply and demand and be perhaps extracting higher prices from consumers that they might otherwise have been able to do. So AI does bring some risk. It will bring some opportunities and hopefully we can hear about both sides, but the risk to perhaps keep in mind that will have an impact in the way consumer markets develop in the future. First of all, you often will see privacy concerns being cited, bias and discrimination, transparency, misinformation and manipulation risks, security risks, of course, but also inequality or social um, economic differences that can be exacerbated by AI. And one that perhaps is not directly concerning consumers, but will impact them nonetheless is the concentration of power into a few companies that are directing the application and also um, that are uh, using and, and collecting the data that powers AI. As far as consumers are concerned, um, the areas in blues are perhaps the more obvious areas of risk, um, but our key question is really how do we respond to those risks and what opportunities do we see? So today we want to hear from three different experiences, three different viewpoints from different um, strands of society as well. We'll start with government and the response that um, has been brought forward in India. We'll continue then looking at um, the FTC's analysis of some of the dangers of AI and finish with um, the Consumer Association's viewpoint on AI and risk for consumers. So let me introduce to you, first of all, our first speaker for today, Sri Roit Kumar Singh, who is currently the Secretary to the Government of India Department of Consumer Affairs. He has occupied this post in 2021 and since that time has devoted a lot of his work to modernizing and bringing technology within the um, workings of his department, creating a lot of efficiencies and um, bringing a lot of benefits to consumers, mostly um, he has facilitated the computerization, video conferencing and e-filing across national state and district consumer commissions, reducing pendency and achieving a historic balance where disposed cases exceeded filed cases. So some efficiencies there. He has also undertaken technological upgrades of different system and more notably using WhatsApp to um, 
enable an increase in registered complaints from consumers. Um, many initiatives, and the one that we are going to hear today is directly linked with AI. Um, he is with his department exploring the use of AI for faster grievance grievance redressal and developing an ODR platform as well. Sir, Freud Kumasing, the floor is now yours to present your work. Thank you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Namaste, everyone. Good evening. It's almost dinner time here, so you'll have to pardon my uh, inefficiencies here. We're very close to the dinner time. Uh, let me first introduce my colleagues here. Mr. Anupam Mishra is a joint secretary who works very closely with us on all the work that is happening in the department. Uh, Professor Rajput is from Indian Institute of Technology, who are our uh, knowledge partners in terms of developing high technology solutions. So we work very closely with the academic institutions in developing solutions. So if uh, my presentation can be shared, then we can start. So um, Ms. Rifa has very uh, eloquently talked about, uh, you know, what is AI and uh, how uh, it is affecting in terms of uh, both the advantages and the risks that are associated. Uh, I will be focusing on a specific subject of uh, using AI to spot dark patterns and help consumer protect themselves, because uh, we have realized that many of the e-commerce platforms have now started using dark patterns to manipulate consumer behavior. Although people love uh, the use of AI, and uh, I refer to a survey by Ernst & Young, uh, where the Consumer Index Survey says that 82% of the participants were found open to improving their purchase decisions using AI. And as uh, Christine also mentioned, uh, use of AI has become very important in terms of consumer interactions to virtual assistants, uh, e-commerce and visual search. And of course, on the other side, uh, the, the supply side for uh, content creation and personalized targeted branding, et cetera, which we face every day. I mean, you search for a shoe in Google and when you log into Facebook, you will see a lot of shoes there. So I don't know how that happens, but that happens. But we must realize that uh, I refer to the bottom box of my slide, that in the guise of technology, uh, e-commerce platforms are also you know, using uh, technology to mislead or to manipulate uh, uh, trading practices. They use consumer bias and deceptive designs to manipulate choice. So I have a few examples here and uh, let me illustrate next. Uh, so I want to ask here everyone, have you ever accidentally opted in to receive marketing notifications? because uh, either it's pre-checked, automatically checked in, or we accidentally check in, and then we started getting this flood of uh, marketing notifications. So I'm sure everybody has experienced here. Uh, have you ever tried to book a flight and found hidden fees? I have faced this. I bought an air ticket and I found that uh, travel insurance was pre-checked in and <clears throat> I had to explicitly take it out because I had another travel insurance program which I was subscribing to. So this is these are some ways where they try to sneak in stuff which you are actually not looking at. Uh, I'm sure many have done it here. I have done it here. I have fallen into this trap. Uh, bought something extra to qualify for free delivery. It happens uh, almost every day. Have you ever subscribed to something and now finding it difficult to subscribe out? Uh, we have... Uh, read many uh, studies, especially one uh, investigation by the Norwegian government where they found that it takes about one and a half to two clicks to subscribe in, but it takes about uh, 10 plus clicks to subscribe out. So making life difficult to get out of a subscription, which is free paid. Next. Uh, so this is just a, an illustration that uh, to know more about such practices, this is how they deal with us. Uh, so they, are, they will tell you if you want to opt out, they will do a, build some kind of a shaming there. No, I don't want to be updated. And then some kind of a false urgency that no link is going to expire. Do it fast, do it fast. Otherwise, you're going to miss out on the great opportunity. So all this is being done through AI and through other technologies to manipulate consumer behavior. And our job here as Ministry of Consumer Affairs is to ensure 
that uh, the consumer knows about it and we are building some tools to the benefit of the consumer so that they can be protected from this. Next. So, uh, of course, these practices are called dark patterns. And uh, we did some research as to how some other geographies uh, define dark patterns. So we found that uh, there are definitions available uh, in, of course, the Digital Services Act of the EU, uh, the California Privacy Rights Act of 2020, and the OECD Committee on Consumer Policy has also uh, defined dark patterns. What we do here in India is uh, we have our own definition. And we, uh, if you permit, I can read it out. It's, so what we define as dark patterns is practices or deceptive design pattern using user interface or user experience interactions on any platform that is designed to mislead or trick users to do something they originally did not intend or want to do. And it follows that it is done by subverting or impairing the consumer autonomy, decision-making or choice amounting to misleading advertisement on unfair trade practice. We use these two phrases because in our consumer law, uh, which is the Consumer Protection Act of 2019, which replaced the earlier acts of uh, the earlier generations, the unfair trading practice is prohibited and uh, the sellers are liable in case they indulge and one of the unfair trading practice is uh, misleading advertisements and uh, practices to manipulate consumer behavior. So all this falls within our, the ambit of the existing law. But to make it clear to the industry and the consumer that they are on the same page, we defined, uh, we did an exercise over last about eight months, and we have defined these 13 dark patterns. Uh, one, of course, is the false urgency. The, this is a tactic which is which creates a sense of urgency that things are you know getting out, getting out, please buy. Then basket sneaking, uh, things will get added when you are checking out. Then confirm shaming uh, that uh, you don't want something, but the website will keep uh, putting it out that oh you want to miss this out, the greatest opportunity uh, available on earth, and so you feel a bit of shame if you are not subscribing or buying that. Next. Then uh, forced action, uh, sometimes uh, they would pre-check a, pre -check a box that uh, I would like to join backstage pass and agree to terms and conditions. Then of course, nagging, uh, they keep pestering you, you're not allowed to get out of it. Uh, subscription traps, you want to, you have subscribed uh, and you want to subscribe out, but they will not let you keep my benefits, cancel my benefits, remind me later. And it would be very difficult to navigate through the process of uh, subscribing out. Then next is uh, the interface interference. We have all faced it. You are on a website and suddenly an ad will pop up and you're looking for that little cross. You want to opt out, you want to close that ad, but the cross is not visible. It's in a color which merges with the color of the background and it is uh, interfering with the interface you actually want to do. Then uh, the traditional uh, fraud trip uh, trick of bait and switch you bought, selected something else, and you got something else. And then the hidden cost, which I gave as an example of the airline ticketing, uh, you buy a ticket, and then when you're checking out, you see a lot of uh, costs added in here, which uh, we've also uh, investigating a few airlines here in India in terms of such dark patterns. Then ads that are disguised, then the billing, uh, you uh, automatic, every month the subscription is getting renewed, you don't want it but uh, it's very difficult for you to cancel that. And some trick questions, which is, uh, so sometimes they'll tell you that it's a marketing technique, but I don't think it is a marketing technique. There's a very thin line of difference between marketing and manipulation. And as Ministry of Consumer Affairs, it is our job and responsibility to draw that line and tell the companies, call spade a spade, that you cannot indulge in manipulative practices. Next. And of course, uh, we all suffer from it, the rogue malware, and uh, you accidentally click and your devices are compromised. Next. So we released these guidelines. We got excellent uh, uh, feedback from the consumers and also from the press because uh, the e-commerce uh, in India in terms of retail has really gone up and it's uh, crossed 10% of total retail, which is a humongous number for a population of our size, which stands at 1.4 billion plus as we speak. So it's a, it's a big problem here. And as government, we are looking for avenues to fix it to the extent possible. Next. 
Now, how does it is impact consumers? I already talked about it, but uh, some things that are mentioned here that uh, it creates a FOMO that you are missing out something, your consumer is getting confused, they are taking certain decisions uh, which you don't want to do, which you didn't want to take in the first place. Uh, the consumers are getting blinded in terms of things getting sneaked in to their cards. Next. So uh, to, to uh, mitigate all this, we have started a process, and I'll come to that thing later, as to how we're using artificial intelligence to detect dark patterns, because it's a tough ask. You are onto an e-commerce site, and at the background, there is a dark pattern that's being used. So how do you detect it? So we are using pattern recognition algorithms. We are training AI algorithms to recognize patterns and analyze the layouts because uh, those companies, of course, are innovative, but uh, there are uh, techniques of pattern recognition that can detect that and you can identify potentially deceptive elements. Of course, in terms of uh, the natural language processing tool, which uh, Christine also mentioned in terms of one of the advanced AI techniques, we can analyze the uh, the text that is being thrown at the consumer in terms of uh, conditions, pop-ups, notifications. And then uh, we will have an algorithm that can generate, that can flag that this is ambiguous or misleading. Language. The user behavior analysis, of course, I said about your shopping behavior, everything is being recorded, everything with or without your consent, the systems know that uh, you have been buying one pair of shoe every month. So even if you're searching for a skirt, they will uh, show you uh, shoes and you say the skirts along with shoes is, is a great deal and you can you know make a lot of, uh, uh, you can save a lot of money if you buy together, things like that. So the user behavior analysis next. Then uh, we in terms of browser extensions, the, we are using AI to provide real-time warning that uh, this thing is compromised, please do not use that. And uh, by analyzing image and visual recognition, because many of the sites, especially the smaller ones, want to copy. Nobody wants to invest money in fresh innovation. Copy even the dirty tricks from the bigger websites. So it's still, by image and visual recognition, it will become easy for AI to detect such patterns. Next. Uh, of course, we need to monitor it continuously because uh, the AI uh, tool can uh, always detect, it can monitor, and uh, it can also see changes in design patterns uh, with the same objective and it can identify. Then, of course, we have a system of uh, reporting and feedback where uh, we analyze user reports. We have a national consumer helpline where we get about 132,000 calls every month. And uh, we, you would be surprised to know that the percentage of calls pertaining to complaints against e-commerce has risen from 8% to 38% over the last four years. So 38% of the 132,000 calls that we get uh, on our National Consumer Helpline pertain to e-commerce, and many of those pertain to such dark patterns. Next, please. And of course, uh, we use educational tools and predictive analysis, and we want to predict because uh, everybody is innovating fast. So we want to predict as to what are the potential dark patterns that the websites are going to use and anticipate deceptive design techniques. So what, next please. So how we have done uh, this, how we tackling this is, uh, because uh, I don't know about other geographies, but uh, in India, uh, governments uh, are a little behind in the technology curve. So we started a hackathon in October 2023. And uh, we clearly stated the objectives that uh, the objective of the hackathon is to design and prototype innovative apps. Uh, we had the four rounds. All top uh, IT companies and top uh, institutions in India, the Indian, the Indian Institute of Technology, which is the elite, uh, tech institutes of the country. They are all participating in it. Uh, we are already uh, more than halfway through the hackathon. Next. And these are some of the visuals from how the students and the researchers and the professors and the companies are participating in this hackathon. Uh, we are going to the IIT, which is the Indian Institute of Technology, on 17th of February, where the finals will take place, and we will choose about 50 apps. 
and then of course we are also uh, giving them about uh, 2.1 million rupees as the uh, reward the first prize in terms of the best app because we will then make it public for the use of uh, everyone all consumers next so uh, what are the deliverables what will come out of the hackathon is uh, the browser extensions add-ons plugins applications also used to be you can be used in mobile apps and they will be used they can be used by anyone to detect dark patterns on uh, e-commerce platforms so if you are logging into uh, uh, your computer and accessing an e-commerce platform this tool will help you in identifying dark patterns to the extent possible using ai and elbit technology and it will alert the consumer about the pattern so he's very why uh, while they're making a choice of purchase next so it is the tool is going to be useful also for the platforms because not all platforms want to indulge in such practices uh, in a deliberate way we have seen that many a times the people managing the platforms are also not aware as to where marketing or uh, of promotion ends and where manipulation begins so this will uh, keep us on the same page as to this is the line and beyond this is manipulation and so they can also use this tool and of course enforcement agencies can use these tools so platforms can use it for uh, self regulation if uh, the tool uh, detects that this is probably a dark pattern and uh, the platforms if they want to get rid of that so this is similar to uh, we engaged with the eu technology people where for safe products on a website they adopt a system that if a product is declared unsafe on website a then the eu system transmits it to all other websites and many of the websites then take down the product because it has been declared unsafe here so i'm saying this because many a times the platforms also want to comply willingly but they don't have the information because the kind of things that are available the magnitude is enormous and sometimes it is not possible to uh, pinpoint at every uh, error uh, place next then of course uh, it empowers the consumer it is a detection pattern uh, it will also help us in dispute resolution when a consumer is complaining against a dark pattern next and of course for uh, enforcement agencies uh, we can use this we can use it for alert uh, to alert both sides the consumer side and the supply side uh, to create public awareness and also to penalize in case in case somebody is a habitual offender is not willing to comply with uh, the proper technique proper regulation next so uh, we also do public awareness uh, we have a through social media we have an 1915 which is the national consumer helpline we have 1800 number as well uh, uh, like today we are participating in your webinar we also do a lot of webinars at local levels with the ministries with the academic institutions with consumer bodies with ngos to tell them because i think a lot of it is to for creating awareness among the users and also on the supply side as to what is right and what is wrong and we are trying to bridge this gap so that everybody is well aware of what is happening on this front next so the way forward is uh, as i said we will offer this ai plugin developed through hackathon for detection of dark patterns to everyone free of cost uh, we will also set up a center of excellence which we would like to call a dark patterns observatory at the indian institute of technology varanasi professor rajput is sitting here uh, we will also do a comparative study we also engaged with a dark patterns lab in australia and we uh, engaged with them as to what they are up to because you know every a lot of things is happening across the world and it is best to share knowledge instead of reinventing the wheel so it's always good and good idea in my perception to to know what is happening uh, in this front on this front across the world so that we are better informed and better aware in terms of uh, achieving at a solution next so uh, just 30 more seconds uh, everybody has heard of green washing but uh, we are now encountering and uh, ms christine uh, rifa also uh, alluded to it there's a new phenomena happening called uh, ai washing 
And what is AI washing? You know, now uh, this AI is a much abused term. And, uh, you know, everybody says, uh, you know, this bulb has AI, this clock has AI, this air conditioner has AI. And uh, I think um, Christine in her presentation mentioned that AI and machine learning are being used interchangeably. I'm going a step further and their AI is being misused by everyone and their cousins that, uh, you know, this system has AI. So a lot of uh, AI washing is happening and uh, I, we see a lot of advertisements where they will say this toothbrush has AI, you know, this thing has AI, this Coca-Cola has AI. So we want to, you know, make our consumers aware that uh, please be aware and, uh, you know, just like greenwashing, where we are again issuing guidelines as to if a product is being claimed to be green, it may not necessarily be that green. So same thing will happen in AI. So this is just as the last, last slide that uh, in addition to making consumers aware of the faults of the uh, dark patterns, the, uh, the drawbacks of dark patterns, we also want to tell the consumer that uh, when you see AI written in some ad, don't trust it blindly. So thank you very much for providing this opportunity. And we are grateful to uh, participate in this seminar. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, definitely one for next year's working program for the <laughs> working group, um, AI washing, which I think will indeed probably um, be something that develops a lot. Thank you so much for this fantastically informative presentation and um, for actually taking matters um, to the consumers. It was great to see photos of all those kids actually involved in finding solutions and, 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 and finding the way to actually better protect themselves. Um, in the spirit of sharing and pulling resources together, I'm going to introduce our next speaker. Dan Salzberg is the Chief Counsel for Development and Innovation in the Federal Trade Commission's Bureau of Consumer Protection, where he helps coordinate the FTC's consumer protection work concerning artificial intelligence. Previously, Dan led the FTC's Office of Technology Research and Investigation, which conducted studies concerning technology's impact on the consumer. He is therefore fantastically placed to address us today and share the work of the FTC in this area. Thank you, Dan. The floor is yours. Thank you. And uh, thank you so much, Tongtad, for inviting the FTC and, and for me to participate in today's webinar. Um, before I begin, I need to provide a disclaimer. Uh, the um, uh, my statements don't necessarily reflect those of the Federal Trade Commission or of any individual commissioner. My comments are going to um, focus today on how automated systems may contribute to unlawful discrimination and the FTC's efforts to protect consumers from AI systems that contribute to unlawful discrimination. Um, so many automated systems rely on vast amounts of data. And they, they rely on this data to find patterns or correlations, and then they apply those patterns to new data to perform tasks or make recommendations and predictions. While these tools can be really useful, they also have the potential to produce outcomes that result in unlawful discrimination. Potential discrimination in automated systems may come from different sources, including, and I'll, I'll give um, four of them, uh, three of them here, uh, data and data sets, uh, automated systems, uh, can be skewed by unrepresentative or imbalanced data sets, data sets that incorporate historical bias, or data sets that contain other types of errors. And automated systems also can correlate data with protected classes, which can lead to discriminatory outcomes. Secondly, model opacity and access. Many automated systems are black boxes whose internal workings are not clear to most people. And in some cases, they're not even clear to the, the uh, the people who make the the, um, the, the systems. Um, and this lack of transparency often makes it all the more difficult for developers, businesses, and individuals to know whether an automated system is fair. And third, designing use. Developers do not always understand or account for the context in which private or public entities will use their automated systems. So developers may design a system on the basis of flawed assumptions about its users, relevant context or the underlying practices or procedures that may be placed, or um, the ultimate users of a system 
may not realize what these assumptions were and therefore use the system in an inappropriate uh, place. So um, what is the FTC doing to address the risks of, um, of discrimination in AI systems? Well, I'm going to talk about three of our areas of our work. Um, we're using the full range of our authorities, um, but primarily we're looking at enforcement, doing research and reports, and providing guidance and rulemaking. So enforcement is the main pillar of our efforts to protect consumers from AI systems that have discriminated discriminatory effects. In April 2023, the commission joined um, some of our, our sister agencies, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, the Department of Justice, and the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission in issuing a joint statement on enforcement efforts against discrimination and bias in automated systems. The policy statement makes clear that existing legal authorities apply to the use of automated systems and innovative technologies just as they apply to other practices. In the joint statement, the agency reiterated uh, their resolve to monitor the development and the use of automated systems and promote responsible innovation. They also pledged to vigorously use their collective authorities to protect individuals' rights, regardless of whether legal violations occur through traditional means or through advanced technologies like AI. And to this end, uh, they, in December 2023, the commission filed a complaint and entered a proposed order with Rite Aid which is a large retail pharmacy chain uh, in the United States that had used a flawed facial recognition system. I'm gonna spend a few minutes describing our case against Rite Aid because the conduct we allege in our complaint shows how a flawed AI system can result in discrimination. Here's what the commission alleged Rite Aid had done. The company had created or had its vendors create an enrollment database of images of individuals that Rite Aid considered persons of interest including because Rite Aid believed that these individuals had engaged in actual or attempted activity at a Rite Aid store, like shoplifting, or because Rite Aid had obtained information from law enforcement. Rite Aid, in creating this enrollment da database, regularly used low-quality images. Um, for instance, images taken from Rite Aid's store security video systems and photos taken with mobile phones. Rite Aid then trained its employees to enroll as many images, as many images as possible, and they enrolled at least 10,000 photos of individuals into this database. The commission alleged that Rite Aid installed cameras that then used facial recognition technology that would capture the images of consumers as they entered or walked around the stores. The facial recognition technology would then compare these captured images to the enrolled image database. If the technology found a match, a match alert was sent to store employees. Generally, these match alerts contained both the enrollment image and the live image, the, you know, the image that was um, being compared, as well as Rite Aid's instructions as to the action that the employee should take if the individual entered the store and had a match. Rite Aid instructed employees to take the stated action if the employees believed the match to be accurate. This system would also calculate a confidence score. The higher the score, the more likely the technology considered the two images to be of the same person. But the match alert sent to store employees would not include the calculated confidence score. It would just have the picture of the, the original picture, the picture of the person as they entered the store, and then an instruction on uh, what should be done with the person. And these instructions included approach and identify. So go up to the person and find out who they are. Um, observe and provide customer service. Um, if they were a pharmacy patient, escort them to the pharmacy. And 911 alert or potentially violent to notify, notify law enforcement and observe. Um, a majority of Rite Aid's facial recognition enrollments were assigned the match alert instruction approach and identify, which meant employees should approach the person, uh, find out who they were, ask them to leave, and if the person refused, call the police. So the commission alleged that the Rite Aid facial recognition technology generated thousands of false positive matches. That is alerts that incorrectly indicated that a consumer was a match for an enrollment in a Rite Aid database of, su of suspects, you know, people suspected or accused of wrongdoing. And the commission alleged that the facial recognition technology was so seriously flawed. For instance, during a five-day period, Rite Aid system generated over 900 separate alerts in more than 130 stores from New York to Seattle, all claiming to match one single person in the database. Put another way, Rite Aid's facial recognition technology told employees that just one pictured person had entered more than 130 Rite Aid locations from coast to coast 
more than 900 times in less than a week. And Rite Aid employees took action, including asking consumers to leave stores based on matches to this enrollment. The commission alleged that um, that Rite Aid um, uh, failed to consider the risks its facial recognition system posed to consumers, especially risks based on race and gender. Although approximately 80% of Rite Aid stores are located in plural, plural, plurality white areas, about 60% of Rite Aid stores um, that use the facial recognition technology were located in plurality non-white areas. As a result, store patrons in plurality black, plurality, plurality Asian, and plurality Latino areas were more likely to be subjected to and surveilled by Rite Aid's facial recognition technology. The commission also alleged that many currently available facial recognition technologies produce more false positive matches for black or Asian image subjects compared to white image subjects. Likewise, many facial recognition technologies have higher error rates for women than images of men. However, Rite Aid made no effort either before implementing this facial recognition technology or at any time while using the technology to, to assess, to, to, to test, to inquire or monitor whether the accuracy of its facial recognition technology varied depending on characters, characteristics of the image subject, including whether this technology was especially likely to generate false positives depending on the subject's race or gender. And in fact, this probably won't come as a surprise, match alerts occurring in stores located in areas where the polarity of population was black or Asian were significantly more likely to have low confidence scores than match alerts occurring in stores located in plurality white areas. Similarly, match alerts to enrollments with typically feminine names, where the enrolled person was likely a woman, were significantly more likely to have low confidence scores than match alerts to enrollments with typically masculine names. The commission alleged that Rite Aid failed to test or assess the accuracies of system, um, failed to train its employees properly on how to use the system, failed to monitor the system, um, and, um, and we also allege that the injury suffered by consumers from such a shoddy facial recognition system is real, not just theoretical. The complaint charges that Rite Aid um, surveilled consumers, followed them around the store, told them to leave without making purchases, including uh, pres prescription drugs, searched them, publicly accused them of being shoplifters, humiliated them, uh, and called the police to confront and remove them all based on facial recognition technology known to produce false positives and especially likely to result in inaccurate matches for black, Latino, Asian, and women consumers. The commission's complaint provides the example of an 11 year old girl who was stopped and searched by Rite Aid staff based on false positive facial recognition match. So the commission's complaint alleged that Rite Aid had engaged in the unfair practice of using facial recognition technology in their retail stores without taking reasonable steps to address the risks that their deployment of such technology was likely to result in harm to consumers as a result of false positive facial recognition matches, and that the company had failed to implement a comprehensive information security program, as was required by a prior order that the commission had against Rite Aid. Among other things, the proposed order would ban Rite Aid from using facial recognition technology for surveillance purposes for five years and to implement comprehensive safeguards to prevent these types of harms to consumers when deploying automated systems that use biometric information to track them or flag them as security risks. It will also require Rite Aid to discontinue using any technology if it cannot control potential risks to consumers. So in addition to our enforcement work, the FTC regularly studies emerging technologies to ensure that we understand them and are poised to confront misuses of technologies. The possible discriminatory effects of AI is something that we've been examining for several years. On this uh, slide, I won't read off the names of these, uh, these studies, but, um, but we have been uh, looking at the possible risk of discrimination in AI uh, since, uh, the, uh, since 2011. And, um, and this has been a feature of many reports that we've, we've issued. Um, one thing I'll note is that um, our most recent report from 2022 identified six potential issues that could have discriminatory if, if effects uh, when using AI. First, the use of unrepresentative data sets. Second, erroneous classifications of data. Third, the failure to identify new phenomena. 
Fourth, a lack of context and meaning. Five, developer bias and re that's um, re reflected in the AI system. And lastly, the risk of commercial surveillance creep. <laughs> We've also begun consideration of whether to implement a new trade regulation rule concerning commercial surveillance. Our advanced notice of proposed rulemaking seeking information to help guide the FTC um, was issued and we consider and we're considering whether to implement new trade trade regulation rules concerning how companies collect, aggregate, protect, use, analyze, and retain consumer data, and how consumers, how companies rather, transfer, share, sell, or otherwise monetize that data in ways that are unfair or deceptive. This notice of proposed rulemaking, or advanced notice of proposed rulemaking rather, recognize that companies growing reliance on automated systems um, is creating new forms and mechanisms for discrimination based on statutorily protected categories, including in critical areas such as housing, employment, and healthcare. And last year, the commission issued a policy statement that gives guidance as to the legal obligations under the FTC Act of businesses that collect, use, or maintain biometric information and businesses that develop or provide biometric information technologies and businesses they use biometric information technologies. So what are the takeaways from the FTC's work in this area? Well, there are really two big ones. First, existing legal authorities apply to the use of automated systems and innovative new technologies just as they apply to other practices. And second, there is nothing inherently wrong with the eye. Like most technologies, it can be used in responsible or irresponsible ways. AI holds tremendous promise for improving lives, but businesses need to act responsibly. And that includes taking reasonable steps to keep their AI systems from engaging in discrimination. I want to thank uh, UNCTAD again and, um, and UNCTAD's uh, staff for inviting the FTC to participate. Um, and, uh, and, and back to you, Christine. Thank you so much um, for sharing um, a wealth of <clears throat> knowledge uh, and information on the risks of discrimination, but also broader risks that are linked with the use of AI. And whilst I think part of your presentation wasn't particularly um, addressing e-commerce, what we perhaps need to make clear to everyone who wants to be more informed by AI is that they are there's, there's a basic of dangers um, and e-commerce is just a step up, but for everyone to want to properly um, address AI and risk for consumers, a good understanding of those very general issues is absolutely paramount. So thank you so much uh, for sharing um, those reports and um, those thoughts. Um, for, for anyone that wants to make the leap. Uh, we're now going to move to our last speaker of today before we can hopefully have some time for questions from the floor. And that is Luisa Crissi Giovanni, who um, is um, um, a member of, um, well, representing a, a consumer association, Ultra Consumer, um, being a member of Euro Consumers, and she will share with us a very interesting initiatives that um, Euro Consumers has undertaken in recent years. Um, more specifically, to introduce her and her knowledge and what she brings to the table, she has been involved in Ultra Consumer. She was um, a member of the, uh, she probably still is actually, sorry, uh, a member of the BIRC executive um, and a member of Consumers Policy Advisory Group of the European Commission as well. So the focus here is more on consumer and consumer associations and how they are looking into AI. Luisa, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christine, and uh, also uh, thank you all uh, for giving me the possibility to share the experience uh, that we develop uh, uh, through one of the projects that I uh, contributed to design because uh, actually my role is representing consumers, but also looking ahead, try to um, shape uh, projects that could support uh, uh, the innovation uh, of the business models, uh, also of consumer organization, uh, with the ambition of uh, uh, also sharing this knowledge uh, to support, namely, 
and, and exploit uh, what these evidence is uh, and support the work of enforcement agency, uh, namely, and also government of authorities in charge of consumers' affairs. And if I may share my screen, uh, you gonna see, just tell me when you see the presentation, yes. Yes, you see it, okay. I go in presentation mode, maybe that is better. Okay, here we are. So this was the project that uh, I was mentioning that actually uh, has been funded by the European Union uh, under the Consumer Programme 2014-2020 and involved uh, at the very beginning initially Altro Consumo, which is the Italian consumer organization that I had also the honor to lead uh, as a secretary general in 2021. But then, as I said, I decided to step in uh, as, as project manager to really uh, try to, to design projects that could support uh, um, the activity of the consumer organizations. Um, and what is it it's about? It's about this uh, exploitation of all the intelligence that we got uh, uh, since I've been working in the consumer field since uh, actually uh, 1994, so nearly 30, 30 years. Uh, well, I realized that there was a, a huge value in, in data coming from consumers themselves that could really be a source of, uh, um, let's say, knowledge for us, but also to feed uh, this work and cooperation with the enforcement authority. Because often when we try um, and we, we discover, discuss uh, at the advocacy table, but also when it comes to enforcement, the problem of most of the time of the authorities was uh, the lack of resources, the lack of evidence that it could back in an efficient way their intervention. And uh, this, of course, arms the market because uh, also erodes uh, the possibility for the good, com the good companies to, yeah, actually um, answer to the demand of product and services in that market. And if we think to e-commerce uh, and online marketplace, this is even more true. And so we wanted to really help uh, the enforcement authority um, to get rid of, uh, let's say, the bad business uh, with the power of data coming from the consumer themselves. So in a way, setting up a system to help consumer, enabling consumers to denounce the bad practice, solve their individual problems, but then in aggregated way, gathering this data and uh, transform this data into really an engine for public and private enforcement actions. This was, uh, let's say, the solution that we want to offer for the problem at stake. And therefore, um, based on that, uh, the specific objective of this, uh, of this project were uh, upgrade the already existing interface of web complaints management of our organizations in Spain and in Italy in particular, uh, although your consumer network is also involving uh, Testa in Belgium and Deco, uh, Deco in Portugal, improving the surveillance of the enforce enforcement tools supporting the authorities, as I said, and developing also coordinated action as much as possible, because of course, uh, most of the case, in most of the cases, uh, let's say the big infringements uh, uh, hits uh, several markets. Uh, uh, we are all interconnected and especially, again, uh, when it comes to the, the online marketplace, uh, we have a uh, lot of uh, cases uh, uh, which are originated by the same malpractice or unfair practice in several markets place at the same time. And of course, it's also had to do with a lot of, uh, with the mindset that we have tried also to de develop internally in our organization uh, to really look and interpret data, which is not a reflex that we have, especially as lawyers or, or you know, um, juridical profile, <laughs> Uh, are used to. Uh? So this competence of really looking at data, exploiting data generated either by AI or other technology uh, should be a kind of skill that we need to develop more and more to be efficient. Um, and in a nutshell, what we've done is really to inject into our platform, uh, integrate it uh, with Salesforce technology. 
to really improve our data and case management and to monitor then the complaint activity, uh, as I said, and create a kind of um, system that could detect at an early stage kind of uh, alert because uh, we, we have a kind of uh, threshold that we measure every month uh, and, and we look back and to see whether these uh, the cases are, are really going up. Uh, probably there's an issue there. And with a certain level of granularity that was possible also thanks to the use of the technology, we could really uh, monitor and, and read the situation and use then the, uh, the knowledge uh, that we, we had to, to do the action. But starting from the front end of our database, as you can see here on the website, uh, I take the example of Altro Consumo, people could actually, instead of, uh, uh, let's say, of course, uh, they can always call our organization to ask uh, help uh, from, you know, so be their complaints. But of course, we've been encouraging them uh, to kind of mode us, do it yourself. Huh? And thinking also ahead to the new generation of millennials, uh, they can uh, insert the data, uh, fill in so the form uh, that we have already uh, pre-prepare with all the typology of complaints, most common complaints, several categories, telecommunication, water, goods, uh, services, etc. And they get, of course, uh, they get in touch uh, with the registered companies that we have on, on the web, web um, let's say, area <clears throat> that we receive. So the case already well prepared with all the documentation and the proof that we collect, uh, well, that we ask the consumer to collect to really introduce their complaint. And of course, uh, we, we monitor and we try to follow this dialogue, direct dialogue between company and, uh, and consumers. And of course, if something goes wrong, uh, we intervene uh, and, and actually we try to escalate uh, uh, but when is really needed. Otherwise, uh, let's say, thanks to the technology, so I want to bring you some positive example of injection of technology uh, into the management of complaints. Uh, we uh, actually industrialize and a bit uh, digitalize for sure this complaints management. Therefore, we can use the added value, value of our lawyers uh, to really focus on the most complex issue. And in case something goes wrong, we of course also give the right address for online dispute resolution bodies that they can go through if they are not satisfied with, I mean, how, how the things are going. But in the back end, what's happened? Instead of losing all this data and intelligence about the outcome of the dispute, okay, we create several categories. Uh, consumer goods, uh, leisure service, education, water, energy, health, consumer service, as I said, and all, all the categories with kind of subcategories to track what are we talking about. With a certain level of, of granularity, we create this kind of complaint dashboard where then we uh, analyze uh, on a monthly basis, but we can do it on a doc. Um, when we want, so, but we also internalize this kind of approach of coming together, as I said, at reading data to look at the top 20 companies with most complaints or the top 20 companies with the highest number of unanswered complaints, because from the consumer perspective, of course, is an issue if they do not receive any answer from, from the company, because they don't know what to do if they want to give, if you want, I mean, the good, in my opinion, um, really level of, of, we really care about the fact that consumer get redress or get satisfaction. So it's not sufficient just to implement the, the law to have beautiful rights written on paper if this paper, if, if this rights cannot be really, you know, exerted and implemented. So we want really to empower consumer at the same time to shape the market in the best possible way. And shaping the market, which is a little bit the motto of Euroconsumer as well, is really helping companies, you know, improving their behavior, in, even in terms of timing of answering to consumer complaints. Uh, as far as the complaint is well structured and, and really well done in order them to reply. 
And then, of course, we look also into the nature of the problems per sector. So if it's a question, you will see afterwards, uh, these are the top 20 companies, for example, uh, most complaints in Italy, that was the extraction of, of last year. Uh, this, uh, let's say, with most unanswered complaint, the ranking. But what is most interesting is really the granularity we can go through thanks to, to the new technology to really also look at the variation from, month, from one month to the other that enable us, for example, to detect that, okay, among the consumer, in the consumer good categories, the most frequent problems for consumers are related, for example, to um, the repairability issues. And of course, now I can do it right now, but we can go in detail to what, what was the issue they were refused with the, the possibility to have the redress or they were denied the possibility to have uh, you know, a new product, uh, despite the fact that maybe they were covered by the after sale guarantees and, and, and what else. So we can see all the variation uh, from one month to the other. In other case, uh, and well, this is the example of, of Scan. You see again the top 20 company with most complaints. Uh, and not surprisingly, uh, because of course there are also seasonal topics. Uh, but in this case, when we, we took the picture, uh, there were a lot of issues with um, you know uh, airplane companies, uh, Ryanair, Bulli, Whaling, e Dreams. Uh, we took the picture just after, let's say, summer. But then when we look at, uh, again, in, in detail, we could uh, also detect, uh, this was again the consumer picture, but I want to go to another aggregate data here, you can see here, that the, uh, let's say, cancellation, in the case of transport service uh, uh, in, in, in Italy, the main issue uh, was flight cancellation, while in, Sp in Spain, as you can see here, the number of cases in Italy, we could do comparison among countries were 458, while flight cancellation was in Spain, 1,200 cases, okay? When it came to, uh, for example, Italy, the main issues uh, were booking modification, while in Spain were baggage claims. What I wanna say is that we can, really through the technology upgrade that we introduce in our platform really uh, could identify a lot of uh, interesting information here is uh, okay again another example of how we could really compare topics from one uh, uh, things to to one category to the other and of course how this uh, um, proved to be a way to support the enforcement authority work because of this classification that you've just seen, because of the meetings or the, let's say, input that uh, actually provoke ad hoc meeting with the authorities, mm -hmm. uh, thanks uh, to which we could identify some, some priorities area to work on. And of course, also, um, once you widespread infringement, uh, you can even start a campaign and you will see also how, not only within our network, but also within the ad hoc network set up by the European Commission to really share with the authorities uh, what could be an issue, not only in the market that we've been monitoring, but also in other national market. And here it came the Samsung case, for example, we detect this uh, unfair commercial promotion in, in Italy. Uh, so people were offered with this, uh, let's say, discount uh, and was not really the case. Uh, so we start seeing cases uh, and we uh, then uh, introduce the cases to the Italian Anti-Competition -Com Authority, Antitrust Authority, and they uh, conducted the investigation. And uh, yeah, we could produce a file with all the evidences coming from the platform. And they actually start the, the action based uh, on, on that. And we could feed actually the action that was already ongoing. And at the same time, we raise the CPC network alert, okay? And so we, we actually introduce through the EMI platform this, this uh, let's say, uh, this claim uh, based on the unfair commercial practice uh, uh, directed basis uh, because we thought there was an issue there. Similar, uh, we detected through the platform 
kind of another strange case uh, that was happening. Uh, as you can see, uh, here's the picture of what's happened uh, in relation to that. Uh, monitoring from August to September 2022 was the picture. Uh, the coming in of the Citroen case, uh, cases uh, going up uh, among the 20 ranking. Um, and when we look into details into these cases and also discover that this was also happening in other markets, we investigate uh, and we started a legal action because people were asked to uh, replace their tank uh, due to an issue with the ad blue, um, the pollutant uh, component. Uh, uh, but was not uh, apparently an issue related to the behavior of consumer, but a, def a defect from the company itself. But you could, as an example, detect that issue of malfunctioning thanks to the cases coming in from the platform. Now, we collected 5,000 uh, people, uh, actually, which are part uh, uh, of, uh, of an action that could really become a private class action. But at the same time, the cooperation and actually dialogue that we were able to open with the Italian Antitrust Authority uh, originated their, their investigation and they recognize uh, thanks also to uh, the, the evidence that they brought in that there was an issue. Unfortunately, despite we raised the alert with the CPC network, uh, the other authorities said that they could not uh, detect cases in their countries uh, and so maybe we should encourage them to set up a, a similar platform like we had, because due to the fact that the other authorities didn't have cases, they actually didn't move. And, and so they didn't really uh, challenge uh, Citroen and, and Peugeot in this case. But as I said, the, our authority, the Italian Trust Authority, opened the investigation for misleading and aggressive malpractice. To come quickly to an end and uh, not, uh, you know, see too much time, uh, these were examples of how consumer complaints uh, and digitalization of, of uh, actually one of the pillars of the consumer organization activity can really uh, represent a resource and value for speeding up the journey of enforcement actions. How uh, IT injection, so in this case, uh, thanks to the help of integration of uh, in artificial intelligence, uh, despite all the technical and organizational challenges I had that, that we experience, uh, is still something that we should uh, work on because it's not just uh, um, when we talk about, I, I, I really uh, much, uh, very much like the, the intervention of uh, the uh, Secretary of State of um, India, the government of India saying that, okay, we are, there's a lot of AI washing because uh, I think uh, there are risks, but there are also opportunity with AI and we need to really, uh, um, you know, being able to, to use uh, what we give us in terms of management of huge data, huge bulk data, in order to really uh, reinforce our backend and capacity to deliver a better uh, data-driven consumer justice. So this is uh, really my wish, and it's not by chance that after the the close uh, the closure of uh, CycleX project, uh, Cycle Cycle One project last year, uh, the European Commission granted us uh, for a kind of continuation. To expand, uh, uh, let's say, our experience, uh, we may be a light solution uh, geolocalized in other countries uh, to benefit other consumer organizations in this complaint management uh, to better report infringement uh, and raise alert to competent authorities uh, in, in a more effective way in all countries uh, and so cooperate mainly with you. And uh, of course, enhance this capacity uh, to really report even transversally. Um, in this CycleX project, we also added an IAT layer, which is a kind of market surveillance activity of several marketplaces. So we're going to scan and um, the situation also via our market research of, uh, I guess, uh, more than 300 uh, websites. So this will be a kind of complementary part to uh, the case collection that uh, you have seen before. And that's all for my side. Great. Thank you so much uh, for presenting to us um, 
what consumers associations can do when they actually um, want to be more effective and actually offering better access to justice to consumers. Um, I have invited questions already in the chat, but pl please, can I remind all participants, if you have a question, put it in the chat and we're going to present that to our speakers for the few minutes we've got less left. I've got two questions for India already in, whilst you're all thinking of questions for our other speakers. Um, so I will put them to you straight away. The first one is perhaps a little bit um, technical. So um, I'll, uh, the, the, the question was about how do you access data on conversion rate of dark patterns to measure their effectiveness? So a question on how to access data on the conversion rate of dark patterns to measure their effectiveness. And a second question for India, I need to scroll down a little bit, bear with me. Um, uh, was a question from um, Antonio Mancini asking um, to comment a little bit more on AI tools that are being used to check fake reviews um, so perhaps um, on the technical details um, of your system and what the Akathon might have revealed. Um, and the comment also said they were happy to focus the attention on the positive results and opportunities of AI to help the investigations and enforcement activity of the Consumer Protection Authority. So I'll give it back the floor to India, perhaps to give us a little bit more details on the technology and the selection process. And then I'll keep monitoring for other questions. India, so please. Think, yeah, if I may, the the idea first is to uh, you know identify the prevalence of dark patterns, and to make consumers aware as to whether dark patterns are being used by these e-commerce platforms to manipulate their consumer behavior. So uh, first of all, we are just looking at the existence and use of dark patterns by the websites for uh, to manipulate consumer behavior. But uh, as Professor uh, Rajput was just telling me, the, one of the participants is already halfway through an LLM, which is the model, uh, a language model that he is developing to identify and train the patterns that the sites are using to indulge into dark patterns. So uh, I am. Uh, I know the question was more about the conversion rate as to how many people are being manipulated to what extent. So I think we'll get to that. But uh, to be very honest, we are not there yet. We are first looking at uh, whether the dark pattern is being used. And if yes, how to mitigate that risk for the consumer and for the enforcement agencies. The extent of damage being done by a specific dark pattern it's a great question and we will certainly, you know, as we proceed ahead on this venture, we will look at it. The other question on AI tools on fake reviews, uh, I just want to inform the house that uh, we take fake reviews very seriously and we have a, the counterpart of ISO, the national standards body in India is called BIS, Bureau of Indian Standards. We already developed last year and standard, which is called IS 1900, IS 19,000. And that <clears throat> standard tells, uh, prescribes a standard for an e-commerce website to have a system to handle fake reviews. So at the moment, India has not made it uh, mandatory, but uh, it's a voluntary thing where uh, websites can uh, adopt that standard. But we have already started the exercise of making it compulsory for uh, websites that will be operating in India. And I'm sure within the next six months, we will have a system in place where uh, every website which is selling some stuff in India will have to have a fake review management certification to improve the comfort level of... Uh... Then uh, I think the question also related to the use of AI. So uh, we already are uh, halfway through in developing a sentiment analysis through LLM and NLP. So first you use natural language processing to do a sentiment analysis, and then you thrash it out through uh, an LLM for further uses and calibration. So we are onto it. 
So uh, we have, uh, as I said, just to recap, one system for fake review management, which is a standard that the sites need to adopt. If I can draw a parallel, if you, you, we are all used to that very sign thing that this sign is, you know, you know, this site is certified for a, uh, for a robust payment gateway and it will not cheat you. So something like that. So it will be a fake review certified that this site has taken adequate measures to handle fake reviews. And we have a system, we have an SOP listed. The other is uh, we now use AI to do a sentiment analysis and you can, it's not tough. I mean, the, the, the cheaters are not that smart. I mean, you, you can look through that and you can see through as to what is being used to generate fake reviews. So uh, as I said earlier, it's a cat and mouse thing. And, uh, uh, and as uh, George Bernard Shaw said, uh, thief is the artist, policeman is the critic. So we follow that logic. Great, thank you. And perhaps I should tell our audience that you've got a degree in electrical engineering. So obviously, you know all of that technology, you understand it. But for the lawyers in the room, it's a bit like, ooh, LLP, NLP. Yes, um, um, but I think that's that's a great point that we, we need to actually work more in tandem with different disciplines, because AI is really throwing a huge challenge at us, which is not just what it can do and how we combat it from a, from a consumer protection point of view, but also how we adapt to understanding the systems and how we harness them. So thank you very much for those responses. We have a, a second question, which I think probably is addressed to, to everybody, but I'd be curious to hear what uh, the FTC position might be on that and whether or not they can share their view. Um, the question uh, came from Giuseppe Tous, um, which was asking if in an environment increasingly driven by artificial intelligence, how can consumer rights be strengthened to ensure transparency, fairness, and safety interactions with product and services based on this technology? Should specific provisions be added to the current legal frameworks? Now, I know in the EU that's underway. I wondered whether um, in the US you had um, some views of creating new regulations to deal with those issues or whether or not um, that was dealt with uh, in a different way. Dan, please. Sure, that's a, that's a great question. And in terms of, you know, what can I say? Well, as long as I repeat the disclaimer that I'm not speaking on behalf of the FTC or any particular commissioner, um, I, I guess I can I can get, try to give that an answer. Um, here in the United States, I think the, the, key, the key message is that um, the same laws that apply to, um, uh, to conduct generally without AI are going to apply to conduct with AI. And um, and that may require some some you know some tweaking at the edges, but there are bedrock consumer protection um, standards that apply no matter what technology you're using. Um, you know the the transformation to a an economy that has uh, lots of artificial intelligence um, is just another transformation. We've had transformations from um, society where we had in person sales to distant sales through telephone through internet marketing and. Um, and kind of the basic standards of consumer protection of deception being prohibited and unfair practices being prohibited have continued on despite these transformations. That being said, um, I think that, you know, they're depending on the specific laws of particular jurisdictions, there are going to be, um, things that, that can occur in a, uh, in a, in an economy with AI that aren't easily addressed by existing laws. And, um, while the, the commission hasn't endorsed any of the proposals floating around Congress, um, there are some interesting ones. There are proposals to um, to ensure that there's upstream liability for model, uh, you know, creators of, um, of AI models who haven't adequately tested or, and uh, similarly imposing obligations on uh, users of these models uh, who haven't uh, who haven't tested them, haven't assessed them to see if they're if they're accurate, if they produce results that are fair. Um, you know, I, I know at the at the FTC we are very concerned about uh, uh, some aspects of generative AI, mm -hmm. and um, particularly the effect this has on creators of content, and how do you protect people whose livelihood has been uh, taken and used to train a model that will then uh, essentially compete with the very people that it took the content from, um, and there are you know there 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 might be um, uh, changes in laws that are required to adjust um, you know, copyright protections. 
Uh, again, that is not something the commission has, uh, you know, we, we've raised the alarm about the issue, um, but we have not um, pointed to specific changes in copyright law that are necessary, but there may be some that are. Um, similarly, there are, some, there are proposals in Congress uh, that, that would require the watermarking of generated AI content. Um, this is to ensure that, that um, systems that use it can identify between the real and the fake. Um, and, uh, and and there are actually a number of proposals in Congress doing that. So so that's a long-winded way of saying that um, basic, basic laws apply, um, but at the edges, there are likely to, there, well, I won't use the word likely. Uh, some, so, some think that there are likely uh, to be uh, necessary revisions to the law to ensure that, uh, that consumers are protected from, um, from misuses of AI. Great, thank you so much. We are running out of time, but I'd like to put a last question to Louisa, um, which is a question that comes from John McNally. Is there potential to develop an AI-based IT system for the CPC network? Um, and obviously for those of you who are not knowledgeable in European or in the EU, there's such a thing as called the CPC network, which is actually a collaboration between consumer protection agencies across the member states. So Louisa, what is your view for um, AI-based IT systems being rolled out at EU level? Uh, I, I'm optimistic. Uh, so I think it's, it's a question of mindset and willingness to make it happen. Of course, it is, it's a te technology. Uh, so I'm neutral about it. Uh, the point is really, are you um, a kit or, or do you want to really uh, use it because it's not a, it's just like you know setting up uh, a website and then uh, um, let it go uh, you, you really need to commit uh, to interact with people or to as i said before look at the data so it's never a question of uh, technology is uh, how you use the technology so i rather reverse the question and say okay we can for example even uh, offer <laughs> our expertise to geolocalize uh, the one live version of the platform that we have uh, developed uh, offering it not only to consumer organization but when is the case also to the government authority but the point is uh, uh, that there should be on the other side uh, a human being uh, who wants uh, to really um, use uh, the, the value and the data and read the data that will be generated and uh, you know uh, enforce uh, then the decision and uh, really make good use of that. But if I also can uh, mention uh, uh, and try to answer to the previous question, we uh, at a consumer level ran a survey in four countries last year, and that's from Italy, Spain, uh, and Portugal. And the request uh, in terms of uh, yeah consumers' view um, of of uh, more protection uh, absolutely tackled the problem of uh, lack of transparency when it comes to AI. So. People is also open to use the technology, but uh, the expectation is uh, uh, that not only the, the authorities could tackle discrimination, but the future legislation could really frame and shape uh, uh, the data flow uh, and uh, guarantee yeah. that uh, you know uh, the potential infringements or, or really uh, usage of data is uh, managed in a transparent way because, of course, then it could generate otherwise uh, abuse or uh, bad exploitation of the data generated by the interaction through the powerful technology that uh, we are offered. Thank you. Well, thank you so much to our speakers. I'm really sorry we've run out of time for the questions that I know were there in the chat. Now, it's not the last opportunity you have. You can come back tomorrow and we'll put those questions to our speakers. We also are going to continue our exploration of AI and consumer protection in our next seminar. Um, and um, in our next seminar, we will actually link with what's happening on the other side um, and look more specifically at how enforcement agencies 
like uh, Christina, um, Luisa, you have done in your organization can harness the technology to have a clearer pictures of the problems and provide um, solutions that will streamline um, the time that is spent by enforcers to actually devote their resources where it actually is most needed. So join us for our next seminar. Uh, Valentina, can I just double check with you the date of the 29th of February? That is correct. Yes. Um, also taking place at 2 p.m. CET time. Great. So um, you're welcome to join us tomorrow or join us on the 29th of February, where we'll have another great panel of speakers to continue to explore um, AI and consumer protection. What are the risks? What are the solutions? What do we do with it? Uh, and hopefully that will enable all of you to reflect we will be producing a technical note on AI and consumer protection. If you're researching, if your agency is working in the field, if you have any experiences that you wish to share with us, please do contact us so that we can look at everything that is happening um, in our community and are able to report um, on those important changes. With the time that we've got left, I would ask you to join me in thanking our three great speakers. Um, who joined us today, Rohit Kumar Singh um, from India, who talked us through what consumers can do in future, what apps we're going to give them to help them detect dark patterns and protect themselves even before they are falling victims of those nasty uh, practices. Um, Dan Salzberg from the FTC in the US, um, looking at discriminatory practices and how we need to be aware of the risk that before consumers and avoid any discriminatory use of AI. And finally, Luisa Chrissy Giovanni, who shared with us uh, the Cycle Project and what uh, Euroconsumers has been doing in terms of having a better view of complaints and helping um, consumers access much better justice. She named it data-driven consumer justice, and that's also part of protecting consumers against the um, AI-generated practices that might actually cause them harm. And on that note, thank you so much to our audience and all our speakers. Thank you. Great, we're all done. Thank you very much, everybody. So nice to see you all. Thank you. And Thank you. to our questions that are left unanswered, um, one of them, Michael, we might be able to answer <laughs> at one of the meetings. Um, and I think there's another one that I've missed, um, but I will pick them up for um, next time. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Very much. See, see you later, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations.